And let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this day, another day of life in your creation, surrounded by the beauty that is all around us, as well as the ones that we love. We thank you for each gift, and may we recognize them on a daily basis and come before you and praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please stand and join as we sing together our opening hymn, number 221, All Praise to Our Redeeming Lord. Join me in our responsive reading, which you'll find in our bulletins this morning based on Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. See how they lie in wait for me. Fierce men conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine, Lord. I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my heart. Lord God Almighty, rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Show mercy to the wicked traitors. 
They return at evening, snarling like dogs, and prowl about the city. See what they spew from their mouths. The words from their lips are sharp as swords. You are not friends, God. I watch for you. You are my fortress, my God on whom my hand rely. For the sins of their mouths, for the words of their lips, let them be caught in their pride. But I will sing of their strength. In the morning I will sing of their love. For you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. seated. I'd like to invite our children to join me down front for our children's moment. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? You seem kind of quiet. Uh, I want to show you guys a little something here. Uh, do you have any idea what this contraption is? Okay, I think your hand was up first. It's a gavel. That's right. Very good. Gavel. That's right. It is called a gavel. Do you know who uses a gavel? A judge. That's right. You guys are on the ball today. Uh, I bet you don't know why I have it, and I'm not going to tell you. So... Now, have you seen you know, TV shows or actually been in court to, to know what, a, what the judge does with the gavel? What, what's he do? Go ahead. Um, he hits it with a loud bell. He hits it with a loud bell, close. He, he's, when he's up on the bench, like when court's ready to start, he'll uh, court is now in session, yeah, more or less. Or if people are being rowdy, he'll, he'll bang it again. This is what you see on TV all the time. Order! Order in the court. You guys be rowdy for me for a second. Be rowdy. Come on, guys. This is like second nature. To... Okay. Order. Order in the church. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Well, since I own this, this means I'm able to judge people. Okay. Why does everyone laugh? Oh, you know what? I bet they're familiar with the scripture that says... Judge not, lest ye be judged. That's some fancy language. It kind of means you're not to be the judge of other people. That's God's job. Now, that doesn't mean we don't have to have good judgment. We have to have good judgment all the time. And your parents and your, your Sunday school teachers and, and the people at church and other people that are looking out for you are always trying to teach you to have good judgment, to make good decisions. And they'll say, you don't want to be doing those kinds of things that those people are doing over there. Now, there's a difference between saying, don't do what those people are doing and pointing your finger at those people and saying, ooh, you're bad. You're worse than I am. I'm good, you're bad. That's when you're judging them. So we still have to have some good judgment about the choices that we make because that is the thing that you are responsible for, not what everybody else is doing. You know whose job it is to judge all of them and you too? You know whose job that is? Answer me! <laughs> it's God's job, and it's God's job alone. And I think that the world would be a much nicer place. People will still do bad things, but it would be a much nicer place if everyone just minded their own business. And that's basically what it says when it's saying don't judge other people. 
You just judge and worry about yourself. All right? Now, if you ever need to judge anybody, I'll let you borrow this. No, no, that's not the way it works, okay? Let's have a quick prayer. Thank you, God. Lord, we just thank you so much for, for how nice you are to us, how forgiving and merciful you are to us, how when we make mistakes, you still love us. Lord, help us to be more like you in regards to that, more and more like our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Children's time dismissed. Let's go to the Lord in prayer then. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you humbly, thankful for this gift of being able to lift our voices to you and to know that we are heard, that we are loved. We place before you the persons that we have named, and the situations that we've described, knowing that you are already working in their lives, but may it be pleasing to your ears that when we have times of trouble, that it is you that we look to. Lord, we know that everyone here has things that weigh upon their hearts, things that are difficult to put into words, things that are hard to share with others. Hear our silent prayers at this time as we lay them before you as well. Lord, you search our hearts and know us even in the darkest recesses, and yet you still love us. What a wondrous love that it is, what grace that you have shown us. May that be something that we carry forth with us in all of our dealings with others as we are gracious to other people as you have been to us. Lord, place in our hearts a burning desire to do your will, to serve your children, to work towards the fulfillment of your kingdom. Show us that you give us the power and the vision to accomplish this. Help us to fight off the distractions of this world, the deceptions of the father of all lies, and the things that would detour us from following the path that you have laid out before us. May we truly live our lives in such a way that when our time comes to be with you, we can hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. That is what every disciple of our Lord Jesus Christ wants to hear one day. And as we are gathered here as his body of, as one, we want to lift up with one voice his very words of prayer as we join together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Precious God, we don't have all that much. These are humble gifts.
but we offer them with the sincerity of our hearts as well as the cheerfulness of our souls. And we hope and pray that they are be used to the glory of your name. Amen. Please remain standing as we sing the first and final verse of hymn number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
This morning our scripture is Luke 22, verses 1 through 38. I want to say that over the next four weeks throughout March, I'm going to be reading extended passages of scripture such as today uh, in order to cover what is commonly called the, the passion story. Um, because this is a little bit longer than usual, if you're unable to stand for the length of that, it's okay. Uh, just please stand it as you are able. Now the festival of unleavened bread called the Passover was approaching. And the chief priests and the teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people. Then Satan entered Judas, called Iscariot, one of the twelve. And Judas went to the chief priests and the officers of the temple guard and discussed with them how he might betray Jesus. They were delighted and agreed to give him money. He consented and watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over to them when no crowd was present. Then came the day of unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare for it? They asked. He replied, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, all furnished. Make preparations there. They left and found things just as Jesus had told them, so they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you, for I tell you that I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. A dispute also among them arose as to which of them was considered to be the greatest. Jesus said to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and sit on thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny three times that you know me. Then Jesus asked them, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, but now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. It is written, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And I tell you that this must be fulfilled in me. Yes, what is written about me is reaching its fulfillment. The disciples said, See, Lord, here are two swords. That's enough, he replied. The word of God for the people of God.
I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. How it should be. <laughs> oh Lord, my God. Oh Lord, my God. How great Thou art. Consider all the worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displays. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art. Thou 
Over the next several weeks, my messages are going to be thematically linked, asking the question, what killed Jesus? As I examine the hearts of the people who put Jesus to death on the cross, the first spike in the hand of Jesus is pride. Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Or as it says in the message, first pride, then the crash. The bigger the ego, the harder the fall. An old parable tells the story of a turtle that flew through the air by biting hold of a stick that two geese were carrying. The turtle was enjoying his unique flight until he heard what the onlookers from the ground were saying. They were saying, aren't those geese clever for holding that turtle in the air? They're brilliant. The turtle felt like he was the one deserving the attention and praise, and he opened his mouth and shouted, this was my idea. <laughs> Except it had probably been more like, this is my idea. I received a Christmas card from a member a few years ago. She was very flattering about my preaching and even mentioned me in the same sentence with Billy Graham. The line I remember the most was, I think you were one of the really great preachers of all time. When I showed Becky, she's like, who is that? I said, well, she is obviously a woman of great intelligence who loves great preaching. And after a few moments, I said, you know, I wonder how many great preachers there really are in the world. And she just kind of under breath said, one less than you think. <laughs> Why do I have to worry about being humble when I have a wife? <laughs> During his prime, Muhammad Ali was a great boxer. And he would go around saying, I am the greatest. Humility was never his strong suit. One day he was on a plane about to take off and the flight attendant had repeatedly told him to fasten his seatbelt. He finally told her, I'm Superman and Superman don't need no seatbelt. She was right on it though. She shot right back with Superman don't need no airplane either so buckle up. <laughs> Pride has been at the root of most sin since the beginning of time. That pride is really what was happening at the transgression in the Garden of Eden. It was not about sex or any other kind of sweet fruit. What tempted Adam and Eve was knowledge. It was the fruit from the tree of knowledge and the serpent's assertion that they could be like God. So I'm reading through the, the, the Passion Scriptures and the, the so-called trial of Jesus. I again, I'm reminded of the audacity of human beings to think that they could judge God. Because that's what's happening. That's what was taking place. They're trying Jesus for blasphemy and affront to God, not aware that he is the Lord their God. Can you, can you taste the bitter irony there? They strove to uphold God's word and to defend God's law and to seek righteousness and God's will and yet failed to see the very embodiment of all of that right before them. They were blinded with pride. God did not fit their idea of what God should be and act like and do. C.S. Lewis says that compared to pride, all other sins, unchastity, greed, drunkenness, are like mere flea bites. He says that every vice comes from pride and that pride is an anti-God state of mind. The most shining example in the Bible of pride is the building of the Tower of Babel. We love to stand back and marvel at what we can do more than even what God has already done sometimes. We still do it today as we 
scrape the sky with our modern towers poking into the heavens. And I wonder how the Tower of Babel might have stacked up against the Sears Tower in Chicago, for example. With the Babel story again, the issue at hand is being like God. They can do almost anything. Do we have that sense today or what? Every day is filled with staggering discoveries and inventions which are changing our world. We've mapped the DNA of, of humans and human cloning is within our grasp. Each day seems to bring another headline in which people approach the creation old temptation to be like God. Doctors say they could make a designer baby with whatever genetic features you prefer. Can you imagine going to the, the doctor? Uh, yes, I would like um, one with blonde hair and blue eyes and dimples, please. Type it up. Thank you for your order. A man brought his boss home for dinner. And the boss, like some bosses, are, was a brash and arrogant man. The little boy in the family just stared at the boss through most of the evening and the dinner and didn't say anything. If you can kind of picture that, they're all sitting around the table and the boy's just, just staring at him. The boss finally said, why do you keep looking at me like that, son? The little boy answered, uh, my daddy says you're a self-made man. The boss beamed proudly and admitted that indeed he was a self-made man. To which the little boy said, well, if you're a self-made man, why did you make yourself like that? Change is happening in leaps and bounds. It's happening faster than our ethics can keep up with. We are confronted with questions we don't even know how to ask yet. One tremendous change in my lifetime is the very tool that I use to write this sermon, the computer. I mean, in addition to actually typing it out and printing it, it was, I was Googling this, I was researching that, I was looking up scripture online. In no time, this device has come to dominate our lives, and it's not just on our desktops anymore. It's in our cars, our appliances. Much to the chagrin of my wife, we have a relatively new washing machine that has computer beeping and stuff, and she's like, I just want something I can turn it on and turn it off. It's in our phones and our toys. There's more computing power in a Wii or a PlayStation than was required to send men to the moon. And when I survey the internet, I cannot help but think of what a tower of Babel it is with two Bs. I saw a meme online yesterday that read, 15 years ago, the internet was an escape from the real world. Today, the real world is an escape from the internet. Now, don't get me wrong, in so many ways, it's magnificent. People can correspond across the globe. It's how I've kept in touch with my family anytime I've traveled internationally. But I've also learned how dependent I've become on this contraption when my tower crashed. Several years ago, 60 million people experienced the same thing. This is reaching way back, but they were so concerned about the Y2K bug that they didn't see this other one coming. 60 million people could not resist opening an email with the caption, I love you. It became known as the love bug computer virus, and it wreaked havoc worldwide, costing billions of dollars. Do you remember if that story, who the culprit was? It was a teenager in some garage basement room in the Philippines who had cobbled together a PC made out of thrown away parts. Our technology globally tripped up so easily. First pride, then the crash. Now as an American, and a southerner in particular, it's hard for me to realize that pride is a sin. We are a proud people. We have been taught to have pride. We don't need no charity. We got our pride. We associate pride with strong self-reliance. And that is a value in our culture. 
But still, it can be problematic if we don't want no handouts, and that's how we think about everything, to understand the whole concept of grace. We think we have to earn everything that we get. And you can see the problems that causes when we apply that to our salvation. We cannot earn what God has to give us. Because after all, what the word charity means is love. You don't earn love. The action of the building of the Tower of Babel was not sinful in and of itself. You might even argue their motivations were good. They were seeking God. They were trying to reach God, to be with God. But the real sin there was they believed they could reach God on their own terms. In other words, they thought they could get to God without God's help. So how can we live somewhere between proud self-sufficiency and sinful, God-excluding arrogance. It kills me that, as we read in today's scripture, after spending years of following Jesus, listening to his teaching, watching his example, on his last night on earth, his disciples are arguing over who is the greatest among them. I could practically hear Jesus sigh heavily before saying, you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest and the one who rules like the one who serves. I have to share with you one of those cool little God moments. I've been listening to the Bible on CD and it's, it's really cool because it's every voice, is a, every character is a different voice. And the guy who played Jesus in, in the Passion of the Christ is Jesus. And uh, it's got really dramatic music and sound effects. It's, it's, it's really cool. And so I'm listening to that one chapter just randomly this morning on my way to church. And it's this scripture. And it's this story. And guess what? Before he says what I just said, Jesus sighs heavily. It's like, boy, I nailed that one. I have a feeling that when Jesus was around his followers, he did that a lot. Here's a lesson I have to learn over and over. I am so confident in my own strength. I will go days and even weeks without remembering to humbly get on my knees and bow before the one who gives me life. Now, I'm not saying I don't pray for you when you ask me to pray for you. I'm talking about my prayer, the kind of prayer where it's just me before the Lord simply asking for the strength to make it acknowledging that I can't do it on my own, to bring to the forefront of my mind and soul that without God, I have nothing. That's a hard admission to make. But God gives us strength, and it has been so since the beginning. We can have our pride to a degree. We just need to remember where it all comes from, everything that we have and are. And while we cannot truly be like God, we are called to be more like Christ in his humble form as a servant, the God who loves us enough to take our sinful pride and bear it on the cross. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, you probably look down from heaven quite often and sigh heavily but we know that it's out of love and out of your desire for us to follow you and to do the things that are pleasing to you Lord we thank you once again for your marvelous grace the forgiveness you offer us may we shed the notions of our own strength and power and recognize these wondrous good things that come from you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, please stand and join as we sing together our closing hymn this morning, number 567, Nearer Still Nearer.
Before we leave, I want to share that the uh, Rose family is not waiting till the end of this coming week, perhaps. Uh, Brianna is on her way to the ER at Park West, perhaps to have the baby today. And they are trying to get uh, Sherry to go to the ER at UT because she's not doing well. And this may also accelerate her procedure. So please uh, just remember them and I'll pass along word as I hear more. As you go forth from here, know that even as you leave this building called the church, you are ever in the presence of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.